<laughs> okay, so the next speaker is getting All set right up. Then. What is she? Let's Hi, everyone. See. Uh, my name is Arlene Ducal, and um, I uh, am a fairly recent alum of the Media Lab here. Um, this is my first demo party, and it's uh, great to come here. It seems so, um, maybe not, you know, uh, only MIT, but very MIT uh, in its spirit and ethos, from what I can tell so far. Um, I'm going to, um, uh, I, I guess about a month or two months ago, um, uh, Val approached me about talking about um, my project Mind Rider. Um, so I'm going to sort of tell you about sort of the journey that um, this project has had. It was my first project at the Media Lab. Um, uh, I'm, I'm calling this talk, This Is Your Brain on Bike because um, it kind of goes back to um, my, my own personal journey as a cyclist in an urban environment. Um, let's see. So um, Mind Rider is uh, basically a helmet that, sorry? Oh, okay. Switch my monitor? Start again. So, um, thanks for your patience. Hi, I'm Arlene. Um, uh, so, yeah, the um, first slide. This is Mind Rider, and this was the first sort of incarnation um, iteration of the helmet. And so, the story behind this is that um, I am a, um, an avid commuter, um, but um, I think like many of us who move through the environment in some way, particularly an urban environment, and I think Cambridge, to a certain degree in Boston, counts, definitely counts as an urban environment, it can be quite stressful. And so, um, you know, even though I really enjoy uh, moving throughout the environment as a cyclist, there are, um, you know, I think that there are ways that we can better navigate throughout um, the environment. And so Mind Rider was an attempt to sort of um, externalize what is internal and basically um, show to um, the person moving throughout the environment, the cyclist or the skateboarder, um, what he or she is experiencing and how place, um, how, uh, how movement can, um, how, how, how that engages um, one's ride. And so basically this is through an embedded um, uh, simple Simplified EEG device um, in the helmet. Um, and this first iteration took um, the brain state of the user and uh, visualized that on a color scale from um, green to red, originally sort of um, a, a nod to the visual vocabulary of traffic lights. And um, so green represented a, a calm sort of um, uh, uh, not uh, sort of like cool. Uh, less quantitatively focused state, and red represented um, high attention, high focus. And um, in the years that I've developed um, MindWriter, I, I, I have observed that it, um, the, the value gets to red when there's um, a lot of like, uh, quantitative focus or, um, or very specific interactions. And so th this first helmet externalized that color as something that the, um, the motorist could see. It was very much um, sort of uh, focused on, um, on, on communication to the external environment. Um, and so that was originally a, a one-off project and I sort of thought, okay, that's that and I have some other things to work on and, um, and I thought that would be that. Um, but a couple of years later, um, last summer, 
um, uh, another researcher at the Media Lab uh, named Sandra Richter, who had done a number of um, qualitative social cycling studies, approached me and asked, um, can we introduce Mind Rider into a new social cycling study um, that is slightly different from what she'd been doing before? So one, what she had done was qualitatively focused. It was focused on interviews. Um, and uh, two, it was, um, it was focused on all different kinds of people. She, she had done, uh, conducted a series of studies in New York. Um, from her original um, research, she decided to sort of zero in on women because um, women were kind of um, a transitional group from what she could uh, tell um, in that, uh, you know, women really seem to, their, their cycling um, uh, experience really seemed to be um, supported by social experiences. They felt more comfortable biking with a buddy, biking in groups, um, and so that's something that she wanted to delve into more quantitatively. And so um, what we did together last summer was put um, a couple of mind riders on, um, on, I think, about two dozen women. And these women would ride um, separately, and then they'd ride together. And there would be an interview after um, each of the rides, as well as a collection of their EEG data. And um, that was a, a it, I would say that there were too many variables for there to be much um, conclusiveness as to um, how, uh, how social cycling was affected, or how women were affected by social cycling. Um, the, these women were also wearing um, uh, um, EDA devices, galvanic skin response um, devices on their wrists. Um, but it was significant for the progress of MindRider and that um, it and um, a number of inquiries from interested users um, and um, interested journalists sort of reignited the project. And so around that same time, um, we um, are, did internally a number of ergonomic studies um, on the Mind Rider, at which had iterated um, to a state where it was um, not just um, a sort of um, standalone gadget, but it became more of a connected device. In that, um, it had uh, there was now a GPS, and we are sort of tracking people's. Um, uh, brain states as uh, on the map and sort of seeing those visualizations um, after the fact and using them to um, analyze rides. Um, and then also, you know, sort of data logging and all that kind of stuff. So one thing that I was interested in, in sort of going through these iterations is um, thinking about the, the wearable of the, the wearable aspects of the helmet as well. It's comfort, the way that it looked. Um, and also since there are these new sensors and new sorts of unfamiliar aspects that you don't really have when you wear a helmet, for instance, you know, uh, a grounding electrode that you clip to your ear, I wanted to um, sort of uh, ascertain what was the most comfortable and what was the most wearable over a long ride. Um, so this is one of our early maps um, from when we started to log um, EEG-oriented um, rides. This is a mine ride near here, MIT. And you can kind of see that um, red to green gradient and sort of see um, where there, uh, I think, I'll, 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 you know, sort of where those high traffic areas, um, uh, traffic, whether they be pedestrian traffic or, or motorist traffic, um, tend to influence uh, the ride. And so um, from there, uh, I moved back to my hometown of Brooklyn and um, embarked on a, a, a fellowship at um, an art and technology center in Manhattan called iBeam. And um, it was uh, specifically focused on computational fashion. So um, my longtime collaborator, Elias Cohen, who's in the middle, and I um, brought on board a fashion designer named Josue Diaz. He's a knitwear designer at Theory to sort of um, continue those thoughts about ergonomics, about um, design, and, um, and sort of implement them more deeply from the inside out. So the three of us, this was our Christmas card, and there the three of us are wearing sort of different, iter different, different kinds of helmets that explore different things. So I'm wearing a 3D printed helmet that sort of, you know, pushes the boundaries of what a helmet can be. Obviously, it's not very functional as a bike helmet. Um, Elias is wearing 
um, a, a helmet that's outfitted for all intents and purposes with mind rider circuitry. Um, and then Ho Sui is wearing um, sort of the most comfortable of, of our three helmets and experimenting with external caps. Um, so since the originally Mind Rider was sort of like very much an in the media lab type project, but since then um, we've been replicating um, or you know sort of producing um, the prototype in small batches and getting them out on the streets and 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 we've been finding some interesting things. So so these are three Mind Rider users. On the left is Josue, the knitwear designer, and he's a very avid cyclist. Um, uh, and an avid commuter. So um, since last fall, he's been um, mind riding, you know, on many days. And then in the middle is um, a new cyclist and a new urban cyclist um, named Alex. And so we wanted to sort of um, put the mind rider on someone who, you know, is not so comfortable and not so used to, to cycling in the city. And then on the right is um, a skateboarder and a rollerblader named Julia. And so, um, you know, we wanted to sort of expand, um, see, see how mind riders' use could be expanded beyond just the cycling community. Um, and there were some sort of interesting observations, particularly between um, avid, experienced, bike riders and um, novice bike riders. Um, the skateboarders are a little more new on our scene, so we're still sort of figuring out um, what the uses can be in that domain. But between the avid cyclists and the um, new cyclists, we see like a pretty marked difference in the kinds of rides they want to cultivate. Um, with mind riders. So Hosue is really interested in, um, in sort of the mindfulness aspect, the, 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 re the meditative aspect of mind rider. And so when he's riding through an area where he knows that he tends to overfocus, um, he will sort of use the, the mind rider to help him um, as a kind of game to help um, him to mindfully be a little more relaxed going through those areas. Um, our, a newer rider like Alex, um, we've been noticing, is more interested in, um, in sort of uh, taking the areas of, of um, high focus and attention on his ride and using them to, um, to exercise more caution um, while he's still figuring out the environment that he's cycling in and getting used to sort of the rhythm of the street. Um, so now I'll dive a little bit into some of the maps we've been collecting. And as I mentioned, Josue has um, been uh, riding um, since last fall. Since he's been mind riding since last fall. And um, I'll, I wanted to highlight some of the sort of regular patterns that we see on his maps. Um, it's interesting because um, a lot of what we see in terms of like patterns that come about are the extreme. So the places that are very red on his map tend to be very red day after day over time and the same thing with the places that are very green you know we see a little so those clusters sort of day after day over time um, and and one area on his ride that um, has tended to be red is this turn um, uh, onto a very high traffic street um, in in Nolita Soho um, that it always sort of pops out um, here, he, he, he finds particularly interesting because, you know, these are two streets that are very close to each other in the same neighborhood, um, but one has um, a, clear, uh, a bike lane and is a pretty clear low traffic street, and the other one doesn't have a bike lane, and it's a pretty cramped street. And so, you know, we've been seeing kind of, you know, day after day after day, um, the, the sort of sweet spot versus hot spot that are so close together. And so, you know, we've started to term the, the very, like, pure green areas sweet spots and very pure red areas um, hot spots and something like this has um, you know sparked the interest of, um, of folks who are working on say bike share um, in New York the Department of Transportation because it's sort of you know with a lot of these sort of quantified self devices um, a lot of times they tell you things that you already know, you know. They tell you that you walked however many number of miles, you know, you, you kind of already knew that. But um, by sort of quantifying that, it helps you to sort of understand over time and understand aggregated over many people or over a spatial area, you know, and sort of see insights that you didn't ne necessarily have anecdotally. 
And so here's one other aspect of Hostway's ride that was popping up over and over again is that he always had this sweet spot on um, the Manhattan Bridge, and so um, which is a car, f the, the 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 cycling and pedestrian area is completely separated, and it's not heavily trafficked. So um, he tended to sort of you know use that time to. Um, well, he already uses that time to relax, but he like with that, you know, empowered with that knowledge that this is one of the most like longest um, relaxed stretches on his ride. That was something that he found to be me very meaningful. Um, so I'm going to take a moment here to um, show you a quick clip from uh, Discovery Channel, which I think explains pretty well um, some aspects of, uh, of MindWriter's data. So hopefully the sound will work. Oh no. It's a popular way to get around town, but if you live in a big city, it can be tricky and downright terrifying. Arlene Ducal is creating something that might help. It's a helmet called Mind Rider that maps your brain waves right to your phone, so you can see and avoid the routes that stress you out the most. So this is actually a sensor that touches your brain. And then this is a light that you can see while you're riding um, that will uh, indicate your brain state in real time. The light is on a gradient between green and red. Green means I'm relaxed, while red means I'm getting stressed out. OK, so we're now connected. Yeah, it's green. And yes, you can see that um, this conversation is a pretty relaxed, meditative conversation. Today, I'm taken to the mean streets to test out Arlene's latest prototype. This is the first time that all the parts are together, so you'll be the ones that bring it together. OK, so we're here in Prospect Park, and barring the rain and the old bike, you should have a very relaxing ride. I, know, I think I'm pretty relaxed right now, right? You are, yeah. Actually, you are turning more yellow. You're concentrating more. And if you have to concentrate a lot, you'll turn red. OK, all right, cool. So i got to start up my app, right, to start yeah. tracking the, the data? Exactly, yeah. We'll map you out as you ride. OK, hit that and go. Perfect. Way, Arlene! Great! How was that? I gotta admit, that was a very relaxing ride, except for this one part. I got yelled at by my first New Yorker. That, that'll be fascinating to see on the map. Before we take a look, I have to bike to my next location. And this one is a little different. Okay, Lucius, here we are in the busiest part of Brooklyn, and we, uh, we're gonna take you around and see how your ride compares to your Prospect Park ride. I'm gonna try to keep it green, though, all right? No red. Gotta okay. try to stay relaxed. Good luck with that. You're turning a little yellow already. Oh, that's right. I keep forgetting I'm wearing this. I can't even be a <laughs> tough guy around you. All right, here we go. Good luck. Really? I have no doubt. I don't even know how to describe what I just experienced. Did you see some of that? I did. I was very impressed. People drive like maniacs in this city. Yeah, they kind of do. Whew, I can't <laughs> wait to see this data. Great. Well, let's go back to the studio and check it. We are looking at a map of your brain data from your Prospect Park ride. It's really interesting to see. You're, you're, overall, you're, you're quite uh, meditative and relaxed throughout the trip. There are some parts that um, you spike up a little bit in terms of um, your concentration. Like here, where I'm zooming in a little bit, is probably the warmest part of your ride. I think I know what happened there. That actually was the end of the bike path. Oh. And I didn't know where to go. Mm -hmm. And there wasn't, it wasn't an obvious thing. Yeah, so I true. came back around, and I think I chose poorly, because I ended up coming back the wrong way. OK. Some other interesting parts right here. Like, you know, you're on this street where you're kind of smooth sailing, and it's super green. But then you have, like, this little burst of warmth there. I know exactly what happened there, too. <laughs> that was when the guy yelled at me. Wrong way. That oh. I was, in fact, going the wrong way, oh, and he dropped okay. an F-bomb oh, on me, wow. which that's going to stress anybody there out, There you right? go. That's your New York moment. <laughs> okay, so this is a map of your ride in one of the busiest parts of Brooklyn. 
look at how dark the uh, the data is there, though. Yes, yes, Compared absolutely. to the park ride? Right? Absolutely, right. yeah. There are a lot more warm <laughs> colors, browns, oranges. And it's really fascinating because you can see the ebb and flow of your brain state in traffic. You can see how it gets greener and then darker and then greener and then darker again. It seems to happen at every intersection. Exactly, yeah, <laughs> every, every traffic light. There were some really sticky parts around some of those lights. Aside from the rain and as busy as it was at some of the intersections and yeah. the guy yelling at me in the park, I mean, how do you think everything went? <laughs> One thing is um, in the software, you know, how to collect um, data without, you know, lagging, leading to performance lag. So, you know, that's kind of a common big data issue. And in the hardware itself, you might have noticed that um, sometimes the, the, the light that you saw started to fade out and that light is really draining on the battery. Okay. So, you know, um, issues that are all small things, but there are a lot of small things. She might have a couple of tweaks to make, but Arlene's proved to me that brain scanning and bicycling go hand in hand. Next. Okay. Yeah, so um, actually that, that, the day that we did that shoot um, was a, um, a pretty good day for getting data. <laughs> So I'll kind of go back in there and sort of drill down, uh, drill down a little bit um, into the ride that um, Lucas took in this, in this segment. Um, so as you saw in the segment, there are two sort of um, asp there's two sort of legs of this ride. There was a high intensity ride and there was a low intensity, a high intensity ride in like a very busy part um, of Brooklyn and a low intensity ride in Prospect Park, which is one of the most um, uh, leafy, uh, you know, park like parts. Um, and so, you know, we can like sort of drill down a little bit more into where you see where you see some of those um, hotspots and, uh, you know, a lot of those hotspots, particularly um, in his interaction with one with people and two with vehicles. So people as in, you know, getting verbal directions from the production team, as in getting sandwiched between all kinds of cars. Um, and then um, part of the conversation um, after this particular ride, um, it, it was really interesting to see sort of his his data turn green where I'm, I'm delineating or where I'm pointing that on the on pointing to that on the map and he said to me that it was at that point where he kind of felt himself get into the rhythm of that traffic um, and sort of you know he, it, he felt like oh this traffic is all crazy but I'm kind of gonna get crazy too so you know he'd like jump on curbs and you know and like make quick turns and I thought that, that that was kind of interesting in that, you know, what we're finding with sort of putting the mind router on a lot of different kinds of people is that, you know, even though there's a quantitative element to, um, to, to this device, you know, to this product, everyone has a very different data set. Um, and so, you know, there are some, there are some kind of, co there are some commonalities, you know, in that interacting with traffic, interacting with humans, you know, can, whether they be in cars or not, can produce sort of um, more intense concentration. But the, the way that you want to, um, to interpret that and also, you know, use that um, to modify your behavior and like cultivate the ride that you want is very different different between all the, the different kinds of people who've been trying mine writer. Um, and then um, here are some uh, highlights from Lucas's low intensity ride in the park. Um, we kind of dwelled a lot in the middle right here where he, he got cussed at um, for riding against traffic. And by and large, this was a much smoother, um, greener ride. But, you know, even then there are still parts that um, he was more focused, you know, not just getting cussed at, but also getting lost. And then again, having these interactions with people, getting verbal directions, that kind of thing. Um, so here is a system diagram, not just of how MindRider, the hardware works, but also how MindRider, the, the ecosystem works. So um, as I mentioned, it's a helmet that um, has a brain computer interface in it and um, Bluetooth that then, uh, uh, and, the and the two sensors, one on the forehead and one on the ear, and that data is then transmitted and tracked and um, geo-stamped on your phone. Excuse me. 
And then one of the um, sort of next steps in this project is as we start to, you know, collect um, these rides and, um, at fr and data from multiple riders is to sort of compare that against third party data. So, for instance, uh, traffic, weather, you know, other uh, social mapping types of data and, um, you know, see perhaps, you know, what are the, the, the interesting patterns that we see that are between those, that kind of cross-referencing. And then also, what are the, um, you know, the insights that you can use to have a better ride for yourself? Um, and then finally, as like right now, one of the things that we're doing is mapping block by block um, our neighborhood in Brooklyn and, you know, um, gradually all of Brooklyn, all of New York City. And so, you know, if you have um, a mind map of the city, again, this is something that can potentially be useful for, for planners, for urban planners, transportation planners, around, and that sort of whole notion of like a, a smarter city. And because this is um, oriented towards um, cycling, perhaps this can support no notions of a green city as well. Um, so, yeah, I mentioned some of the next steps, um, um, specifically um, perhaps uh, um, one thing uh, that we've been talking a lot about is remote tracking and so adding another social element to, um, to this project, not just that you can track your ride in real time, but that perhaps your friend can track you or your, you know, whoever, your, your, your parent or your child can see where you're at, kind of, you know, similar to Waze, how you, where you can see all the other cars on the map while, while you're driving. Um, we're also starting to um, to experiment with the notion of discovery um, or recommendation. So if you have, you know, if you've um, uh, aggregated enough rides over time and you know sort of the patterns of where you're the most focused, the patterns of where you are the most um, uh, meditative, how, can you use that to sort of program a ride that you want, or can you use that to have the helmet tell you as you ride, you know, the places that, um, that you might want to discover? So that's pretty much it. I'll take some questions now and maybe do a demo later. I have a few helmets. Um, and we are on Kickstarter right now until July. It's, uh, it's really nice to sort of time this, uh, time the Kickstarter with this event. And uh, you can learn a lot more about the project on our page. With that, thanks so much for listening, taking questions. Um, so the original version of the helmet was very outwardly directed, okay. and um, but since then you 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 might have seen the um, later iterations have a smaller light. And part of why we made that change is because it was, you know, completely not understandable to a motorist. <laughs> And also, you know, the, it's a drain on the battery and the cyclist was more interested in just, you know, having this data available to him or herself, or the rider. Mm -hmm. Have you done any experiments either with people who are just beginning to ride a bike as, in, as they learn to ride a bike for the very first time, or with people who are riding non-traditional bicycles? So, for example, who have learned to ride a normal bicycle and now they're riding, say, or, or, or a Wait, say, say that again. A, ch a, a chopper or all or a Gotcha. That's that's really that's a really interesting idea. No, we have not put a mind rider on anyone riding a non-traditional bicycle. So we, that would be really fun to try. I think. Um, as far as um, people who are just learning, um, that is in the plan for the next month. Um, I'm starting to uh, to volunteer at like you know um, learn how to bike classes, and I'm interested in sort of play, uh, putting a mind runner in some of the learners. I myself am becoming a learner as well because I don't know how to skateboard, but um, you know I'm learning how to skateboard and and seeing what kind of data comes out of that. Yes. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. That, that's another really great idea. I, uh, we, we've gotten queries from auto makers, particularly when, you know, I was at the media lab and, and would demo the product. So, you know, from people who were working on sensors and cars, um, but not, not from insurance, not from insurance companies. So, so that's really interesting. <laughs> there you go, reduce your rates. <laughs> That's great. Alrighty then? Oh, okay, one more. Um, so you said your first iteration, um, it was, it was um, the light was visible to, to people around the biker. Was the light still visible to the biker even then? No. So um, it really was you know, uh, mutually exclusive, the earliest iteration was just external and iterations since then have been just oriented internally to the, the cyclist or the rider. I take it you took data, you have data from, uh, a lot of data from before and after. I was wondering if you noticed any sort of um, influence on the feedback to the rider in terms of seeing it versus not seeing it at all. And, and if that affects maybe how, um, the, the, the coloration of, um, of the points in the map, for instance. Right. Um, whether, whether it was a very strong influence in the writers, if they could see it, um, to notice, for instance, when they were particularly stressed out. Right. So um, the, the versions of the helmet that have externalized lights, they were not, um, we were not collecting the data or, um, or geostamping them. So I don't have maps per se. That said, um, there has been um, uh, some discussion around um, slightly different light form factors and um, you know, sort of the same iteration round. So on some of the helmets, we have small um, piranha LEDs and on others, we have like larger five millimeter LEDs. Um, and the discussion has mainly been, and, and we haven't formalized, you know, this analysis, but the discussion has mainly been around the ergonomics, you know, uh, um, like Josue, our like, you know, main mind writer has been talking about how the, the sort of gamification approach that he had was tied to the larger LED because it was much more um, conspicuous. But um, with a smaller light, he doesn't really think about, you know, sort of um, uh, 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 consciously changing um, his, his, um, his brain state um, to make the light change. Um, and so, you know, um, his, over time, his preference has become, um, ha has oriented towards a smaller light that's less noticeable. Um, but in terms of sort of taking a look at the data from, um, for, or the map data from two different light form factors or even external, internal, we haven't delved into that yet. Okay, thank you.